This is Russell Gilbert from Uriah Heap, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. is one of the most classic of the classic rock bands, one that from the very start, back in the late 60s, traversed the musical landscape between blues and hard rock and prog and just about anything else you can imagine. The group celebrates its 50th anniversary in 2019, and in preparation for that, Heap is releasing its 25th studio album in just a few weeks. I'm Mark Boardman, reviewer, interviewer, reporter for Sonic Perspectives. And make no mistake, the new album, Living the Dream, is a Uriah Heap album with that signature sound of the Hammond organ, a versatile lead singer, five-part harmonies, great lead guitar, and a very strong rhythm section. For the past 11 years, that rhythm section has been helmed by Russell Gilbrook, who's been manning the drums, and as I say, that's a vital piece in propelling the heap ahead. Russell joins us from his home in England. Welcome to Sonic Perspectives. Thank you very much, Mark. It's very nice for you to uh, invite me on. I'm very pleased to be speaking to you and everybody else concerned. So you've got a little bit of time off in between some touring, right? Yeah, it's festival season between May and August, and um, so the uh, which I really enjoy. I love doing the festivals because it's uh, such a mixed match of um, whether there are thousand, two thousand, up to a hundred thousand, and the people in so many different countries who are eager to hear so many bands in the same environment. Um, it's just great fun to play to the old fans and new fans, and the atmosphere of what a festival brings. And you'll be going out on the road again here pretty soon through Europe? That's right, yeah. Well, we've got the album released September 14, of Living the Dream. Then we have to go in and do some rehearsals because we're really um, cutting the the existing set up and trying to bring back some really old stuff that the band hasn't played for many, many years and intertwining that with the classic ones that we need to keep in, of course, as well as a handful of songs off the new album um, and really give the fans something exciting uh, towards the end of this year going into 2019. Care to tell us what some of those old gems that you're bringing back might be? I'm afraid I can't at the moment. We're uh, emailing each other with ideas and suggestions um, because obviously the rehearsals aren't until the first week of October. And like anything, we can put forward loads of suggestions of some great material, but until we get into the studios, because of the the, the feel, the tempos, and the um, the keys in which the songs are in, we won't know which is going to fit with what and what needs to come after what to make a great show. So at the moment, there's lots of ideas being emailed over, but um, as I said, until we get in the studio, we won't be able to cement the correct songs to make a great uh, set. Mm-hmm. When you were out doing some of the festivals, did you do anything from the new album just to give people a little tease about it? No, we actually thought about that and it was decided that we'd hold back a little bit. We'd let the promotion of the um, the singles come out first on various aspects of social media and then we want to hit them with a, a bit of a bang when we start going out um, the 22nd of October onwards with the new show and then do the new material then. Mm. Uh, plus also we've been working Working so hard, it's been very difficult for us to work up something and just throw it in a set in case it didn't quite sort of come across how we wanted it to come across. When you do a when you do a set, it's very important that the set flows properly and with the right feels, tempo changes, and key changes, as I said. And so, just throwing something in willy nilly might might not quite represent it in the best manner. So we just felt as though we'd we just hang on a little bit and wait till we rehearse it up properly. Tell us a little bit about the new album. Well, the new album's uh, great. I mean, 
uh, the new al- the, the the albums that happened before were very difficult for us because it was thrown upon us. It's the same old story with record companies. Sometimes they don't understand the logistics of our rec- um, our touring schedule, and so therefore they'll just say, "Right, we need an album so and so so and so date," and we're left, um, unfortunately, to try and do an album um, in a few days if you like that kind of thing and, and, and rush it and it's not the best way in which to uh, try and do stuff and because we uh, tour so so often we're doing 100 120 days a year we're out ahead of a lot there's not a lot of time to try and um, write material and then work the material up and work out what the best songs are and get it all together but we made a conscious effort this time that we, we set time aside so that we could bring enough ideas to the table and then do a proper pre-production on those songs and really um, scrutinise the bits that work great and, and, and brought out the best of a particular song. And then when we went to the studio with the great producer, Jay Rustin, we were ready to really fire out those tunes in the studio and bring out the best chemistry and magic of those songs that we can as a band um, to give an exciting album. Is the big challenge coming up with something that's that's new and refresh and yet still is definable, listenable, understandable as uh, as being Uriah Heep? It is to a certain extent, but I think we're a little bit lucky and fortunate that Heap tends to come out when we play together. It falls into a heapy kind of thing. As soon as we start jamming together and start playing off an idea um, together, or a song comes in where the demo might not quite sound exactly how heap should sound because there's one or two people that are doing it, so the whole full aspect isn't there. As soon as we start taking those ideas and songs and, and jamming them out in the studio, it tends to find its way. It's very easy for us with the experience that we've got and we play so well together, there's a great chemistry, that when we start jamming these um, bits and pieces in the studio, it starts, it starts to take a direction. And so therefore, then it becomes really easy and definitive as to if the song is really good and worth developing, plus also automatically creates a sound of heap, which is a bonus for us, makes us work quicker and easier in the studio. Mm-hmm. I have heard someplace that the band typically records sort of old school in doing full takes. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. I mean, it's it's the sad thing that's come with technology in the music business now, where everything is looked on the grid and looks so precise. And um, that to me, it sounds sterile, cold and wrong, because the whole idea of music, um, whether you're an artist or a band, is you're expressing something. You're taking people on a journey. You're taking the fans on a journey. It's a musical expression of what's being created. And that needs to have movement. It needs to have um, something about it that emotionally connects with people. And you can't put, you know, a three-minute song is a three-minute song, but a 20-minute song is a 20-minute song. And to chop it up to try and fit three minutes or to extend it to make it long is the wrong way. Uh, You create a piece of music for a reason, and it should be the length that it is. And it's the same as the playing aspect. You create that certain magic and the chemistry through through everybody in the band playing together as a unit. Once you start isolating the instruments to try and record it, you're losing that magic that goes on between everybody uh, performing at the same time in a studio. And so therefore it's important for us because we, we're we good at it and we're capable of it is to put down those backing tracks as a unit to keep that magic there and that chemistry there um, and then put the other aspects on top of that. Mm-hmm. It, it would seem to me that it also makes it easier then to transfer what you're doing in the studio to the concert stage. Exactly. I mean, it's just all you end up doing, and it's just going on stage and performing it. <laughs> it becomes much easier because you're you're playing your parts within the the song, and um, you've played them together already. And all you're doing is refreshing yourself in the studio, rehearsing, fitting the appropriate songs that work within that uh, set list, as I said earlier, and going out there and giving the people the best time of their lives. You mentioned that Jay Rustin helped. 
uh, in helming this particular album. He's worked with the Winery Dogs and Dan Thrax and Steel Panther. How was he selected for this project? Well, like anything, when, when, when an album comes up, um, what comes up in the ballroom or the meeting and discussions on the road is what kind of producer we feel might serve the purpose at the time. And, and um, we just felt as though on this particular occasion, we wanted to move in a different direction. We wanted to, we wanted to keep what UI Heap's all about, but there's no point in us, no point in us not moving forward with material as well as a producer and have a bit more of a cutting edge producer that uh, understands the band, number one, understands what's going on in 2018 and beyond, number two, and has that fresh outlook on the band um, that may give us something that um, helps us moving on as a band in the journey of our musical career. And Jay came with all those attributes, and um, it was certainly a pleasure to work with him in a studio. He was very respectful to us, as we were to him. He allowed us to just um, crank it up, um, play together. He was very pleased with the um, the songs and the arrangements and everything like that, so it made the recording aspect of it very easy and made it run so smooth that we were able to record in three weeks and get a fantastic album out of it. That's, that's pretty quick. I mean, relatively yeah, speaking, really, nowadays well, bands take a lot of time. Exactly. And it's not something that um, works with our brain mechanisms. We, we like to um, record in a, in a very quick way because we're all accomplished musicians. We play well together. We have a good understanding and we do our preparation well. But Jay wanted to do one song at a time. He felt as though if you just do one song, it allows a lot of hours for you to accomplish that one track, which meant you're now now rela- far more relaxed. The more relaxed you are as a musician and an artist, the easier it is to play. And because we've done the pre-production, we understood what parts we needed to play. It was just a case of the performance. Well, in a whole day to do one track, track it's much easier to relax and just perform two or three times so that's what happened and so the tracks went down very very easy indeed it was very easy for us to perform Mm -hmm. for the most part um phil and mick have done most of the composing for a, a number of years uh was that the case for this one as well yes it was for most of the case yes it's just that you know it goes back to the hard touring that we do um, it's very difficult where everyone lives for everyone to get together and throw in all the ideas that people have as individual musicians. Um, Phil and Mick have worked like that for a long time, so um, they're always doing bits and pieces in between touring at home. So collectively, they obviously threw all those bits and pieces together, and then all those ideas come to the studio, and then that's when we listen to it as a band, and we take the stuff that gets us going and we work on that stuff we might change that arrangement there and put that little bit in there and then it, it, it ends up coming out um, as the right heap on the album that people end up hearing so um, Davies you know, had a little bit more input on this one he chose to um, work a little bit at home and like everybody we all tend to um, have our ideas that come to the table and we try and utilize what we can to bring out the best album possible. Mm-hmm. The lyrics for the the first single, which is also the kickoff song for the, the album, which is called Grazed by Heaven, were written by Jeff Scott Soto, who's uh, with now with the last year the the band Sons of Apollo. How'd that come about? Well, because um, he's friends with um, Dave, the bass player. Mm-hmm. And Dave at that time was um, very keen on um, writing, as you would do as an artist, you're very keen on writing material and trying to present it. And he just wanted to present um, this particular track to um, 
the band and he just felt as if Jeff had something to offer and so they just got together and it sort of just fell into place like that and we were very very pleased that it did because the song uh, became the first single as he quite rightly pointed out we think it's a, f a phenomenal way in which representing uh, Uriah Heap in 2018 going into 2019 and um uh, Jeff was a great part of that and came up with some great lyrics, uh, lyrics and uh, um, melodic parts, and um, hopefully we've done it just. It is a great song. Great kick off to an album, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, we. Um, it's funny because sometimes you get um, the feeling from certain people throughout the world, whether they're fans or whether they're part of the social media, that these old men are going to get on stage and drag themselves through some old hits of Demon Wizards and stuff. And uh, if they haven't seen the band, you know, in the last decade or whatever, they don't quite understand that we still are formidable force on stage with very high energies and power. And so therefore we wanted this particular track to um, make sure that people realized that we were still ready to go out there and, uh, and kick ass, if you like. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I think also shows itself is it's been five years now since Dave came on board uh, taking over for Trevor Bolton. And so you've basically had this group of players in Uriah Heap together for five years. Uh, it must feel like you guys have gotten to a point where you know each other, you, you can react to one another, and probably even more solid as a band. Yeah, I mean, the important thing about getting um, someone new into a band, uh, uh, whether it's for unfortunate situation, um, is finding that right player. You know, it's not a case of just getting a, a good enough bass player in. It's not a case of getting someone that looks good. They've got There's so many components and ingredients that go into um, getting the right player in, you know, they need to be the right personality. Uh, what I like about Davey, when I got Davey in the band, it was Davey was exactly like Trevor to me as a player. I didn't have to, I don't have to think about timing. I don't have to think about any phrasing. I don't think about anything. It's like putting on the perfectly made suit to wear. Um, I don't think about anything. He's just there. And he, all he's doing is complimenting my bass part, uh, my, my drum part, and my drum part complimenting his bass part to make us a powerful rhythm section. And um, it's very rare to come up with um, musicians that are, are doing that because they're, they're the musicians, when that type happens between whether it's guitar, drums, guitar, bass, whatever combination it is, that's why the chemistry and the magic works in the band because there's just a special thing that happens in the result of what you do when you play together. So when Davey came in, I knew, because I played with Davey before, I knew that his bass playing, his personality and everything would fit Uriah Heap and also complement what Gary Thane and Trevor Bold had done before. And I, I personally think it does. And going by what people have said since Davey's been in the band, um, they think so too. So it's, it's um, very good for us. When you've got a band that's as long-standing as Uriah Heep, you're going to have some, some changes. It's just going to happen one way or another. And as you mentioned, for for Davey, he has to look back on Gary Thane and, uh, and Trevor. You look back at some of the previous drummers, like, of course, Lee Kerslake, who held that throne for, for years. Nigel Olson held it for a while. And uh, Chris Slade also was a drummer for a while. It, does that ever cross your thinking that, well, maybe I've got to do some of the things that they did, or I've got to just ignore that and do my own thing? Yeah, good question. I mean, this happened when the audition came up for Uriah Heap. There was two ways I could play it. Because I was brought up, thanks to my drum teacher and my parents, I was brought up and schooled to um, be a drummer that can do anything and play anything. And luckily, I, I worked my backside off and practiced where I was able to do that. So I did a lot of sessions and did every kind of gig. And when this came up, there were two ways I could go. I could either 
be a Lee Kersley clone because he'd been in the band for so long. So if I played his parts really well, they would like it because that's what they're used to. Or I go, this is my time. I'm an individual human being. And this is what I would play on those tracks if I was in that band from day one. And I chose to do the Russell Gilbert Road and not the Lee Kersley Clone Road. Now, it could have backfired, but as it happened, luckily for me, um, everybody in the band didn't want the Lee Kersley Clone. They wanted something that might freshen the band up or change the band in some way to excite the band to keep moving forward because the band was a little bit tired at the, uh, at the time uh, towards the end of Lee's um, time with the band. And so, therefore, because Lee doesn't play double bass drum, I play double bass drum. I, you know, put extra little bits in certain things. But because of my professionalism, as I was taught by my drum teacher and zillions of gigs, I wasn't there to damage any songs. I was there to respect the, the songs and play the parts that needed to be played. But it would be the Russell Gilbert way of doing it. And uh, luckily for me, they liked it, the fans liked it, and it made the gig very easy and very comfortable and obviously very happy for me. As you mentioned, you're maybe not the stereotypical quote-unquote hard rock drummer because of your, your teaching, your experience. You played with people like Lonnie Donick. Did you play skiffle with Lonnie Donegan? I did. I even played. I even played washboard with Thimble. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> I did, and like you know, what I like about all that, you know, I did Van Morrison, I did Helen Shapiro, I did Alan Price uh, with um, Bobby Tench and Zoot Money, and Lonnie Donegan, um, and John Farnham, and you know, I've done almost every gig you can think of, whether it's a pop gig, punk gig, funk gig, uh, African gig. I've done it all and the, what I like about it is once you've done that and you've experienced that and you do a good job now that becomes part of your DNA so as a musician I've got those ingredients and qualities in me and I feel as though that they can add something to my playing that enhances what is going on with Raya Heap to give them a little dimension without suffering anything yeah when we did Wait to Sleep for album when I first joined the band we were struggling on a track called Tears of the World in the middle bit because they didn't want to keep the shuffle going and they were scratching their heads. And I just joined the band and I just turned and I said, well, can we do in the middle? I think we should go to an Afro-Cuban 6-8. Now, if you hadn't studied that kind of thing, if you're just a bog standard rock drummer, you'd never come up with that idea. Tears of the World wouldn't have happened because as it, as it happened, I came up with that idea. I played it and they loved it so much that it's on the album. I'm playing an Afro-Cuban 6-8 in a rock style on a Uriah Heap album, um, and the producer and everyone was happy with it. Now, that's the beauty of music to me. What you're doing is you're bringing in a flavor that works but doesn't destroy what's going on, which is the most important thing in the song. I have dug through online to find some of the music that you've played with other groups and individuals. And I found Chris Barber's Jazz and Blues Band. And it's sort of Dixieland yeah. and some of their stuff. So, yeah, Dixieland. The biggest, he was the biggest Dixieland guy in the whole of Europe. We used to play the 5,000 people a night. Really? And, um, and I played with... Um, He's had some guests. He had Rory, Rory Gallagher as a guest. He had um, Howard Ashby, one of Duke Ellington's saxophonists, as a guest. And I played as a quartet with him, the bass player, and the guitarist, and um, Howard Ashby. And Wendell Brunius, which is one of the trumpet players from Preserva Preservation Hall, New Orleans. So, to, And I gained experience from them guys, because, you know, I'm brought up in England. It's not the biggest in the jazz world. And I was schooled on jazz. I love jazz because I love music. I love drumming. I don't care what it is. I just love music and I love drumming. I brought up on jazz and I get the same excitement from tearing up a lovely jazz piece and making it swing its backside off as I do from rocking upside 
something and rocking the shit out of it. It's exactly the same thing for me. There's no difference at all. The only difference is is how I'm approaching that music with the musicians around me. Sure. And to have that little touch, as I said, I play so many little ghost notes that, I, that come from uh, control and dynamics with my technique that I can imply into heap that gives it a slight different dimension to say, you know, Cozy Powell used to, didn't do a lot of ghost notes. Cozy Powell used to hit them hard, hit them solid. Nothing wrong with his playing, superb player. I think Cozy Powell's fantastic. But for me, if I had that other dimension, it's like Simon Phillips had to it with um, The Who and that. He's got a jazz background. You can add certain other little flavors. It just gives it a little bit more of a musicality approach that can, doesn't always, but can enhance what's going on and just give it a nice extra flavor that perhaps other musicians can't do. That's an attribute that I'm proud of because of my upbringing and my um, career, how it went. And I'm hoping, and so far I'm, I'm right, I'm hoping that it sees me as a player, as an individual, it sees me through my lifetime as a musician. Mm -hmm. With doing a, a hundred plus gigs per year with Heap and then doing recording, etc., do you have any extra time to delve into those areas at this point, or is that something which you just have to put off? Yeah, I have to turn down more than I can do. I mean, I, I get asked to do quite a lot of... Um, bits and pieces, all different kinds of stuff. And I just, a bit too busy with Heap. I managed to do, as a German band called Avantasia, a couple of years ago, they asked me to uh, play on this. It's like a rock opera band. Eric mm -hmm. Singer played um, drums on a, a previous album of the year before, I think, and I did the one after. And that, that was, um, I was very... You know, I felt, I felt honoured to be asked to do it and I thoroughly enjoyed doing it I did a great job on it and I, I love the album it's a fantastic album um, but unfortunately more often than not I'm so busy that I have to turn down uh, more stuff but I do like to play lots of different stuff because it keeps the creativity going it's like anything if you keep playing the same sort of thing all the time you're good at doing that but other things get a little bit stale because they require a different headspace a different uh, control mechanism a different drum setup cymbal setup there's so many different elements that it requires if you don't do it for so long you just get a little bit rusty at it and i'm a, an all-round musician that likes to um play all kinds of music for different reasons because i just adore playing the drums mm -hmm. You've also had a background in teaching. Uh, do you get to do that much anymore? Yeah, I do. I, I manage to be. A, it's much easier to um, get booked within two weeks off to do, go and do a couple of master classes at a big music uh, college or something like that. So I still do that. And the beauty of that is I can't lie, can I? I'm doing what they want to do. I am, as a quote, living the dream. I'm touring the world, playing in front of thousands of people doing what I love, playing the drums. So I'm able to not only um, explain to all of the students and uh, people about touring, the reality of touring, um, what it's expected to play, how, you know, the recording process, the audition process. I've done the whole lot. So I can actually explain from real life situations to all the drummers and other musicians as well, exactly what it's like uh, to... Um, you know, be in the music business and survive in the music business, um, which is what they all want to know, and try and get them away from all this stupidity that's going on about being the most technical player in the world. You know, uh, that seems to be going down at the moment. All they're interested in is all this um, really high technical stuff, and it's just not, it's, it's a percentage of playing, but it's not all the playing. And then they need to get their head spaces around being more of an, indi like you said earlier, being an, an individual kind of player rather than a copycat. Mm -hmm. I imagine that uh, that could be a rough thing to try and get the, across to young people who uh, sort of have their own set ideas on this is what I'm supposed to do. Exactly, because that's another part of social media with YouTube. You know, there's so many experts on YouTube, but basically, what have you done then? Well, most of them haven't done anything. They're just experts on YouTube. And as I've just pointed out, you can be a great player, but a great player is just one little ingredient. There's other ingredients that go into it. You know, you've got the fear. How, how, what's your feel like? Uh, 
we don't know what you like when you play. You might be a great um, technician, put them in a band, and suddenly you can't play because you don't use your ears. You're not interested in listening to what's going on. Um, you might be have habits that go on tour that don't sit very well with other people, and you end up having arguments after being on the road for six days. You know, it's, there's lots of ingredients that go into being a successful musician. Uh, playing is just one of them. And, um, you know, the, 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 the more that people realize that to gain the right information from the right people, if you're serious about being a professional musician, that's what you've got to do. And it's very difficult to try and put that across when you've got the likes of YouTube because people think they've got access to everything they need to know on a, pre a push of a button. And they don't talk to anybody about uh, anything anymore. Yeah, that's, that's one of the issues with social media, no matter what the field, whether it be music or art or any kind of intellectual process. Uh, people forget how to interact and how to listen, especially listen. Yeah, exactly. They just, they just um, you know, and, and, and I do blame uh, the powers that be that are, that are actually capable of stopping this and they don't stop it. You know, you've got music shops that are just going under all the time and going out of business simply because they can't compete with online stuff. Well, you know, at the end of the day, if the music business was to promote the reasons why you have to go into a music shop, mm -hmm. and if the understanding was put across to the people growing up mm -hmm. of this is why you go into a music shop, then they would go into a music shop. But if there's that gap there, all the kids know is they've got their phone, they type in, and away they go. They're not being told any different. You can't change people's perception if they don't know about it. Well, we, uh, I used to go into music yeah. shops. I used to go into music shops, and it was part of my networking as well, because in music shops, that's where musicians go. And sure. musicians go to find musicians, because that's who they play with. So you went in there to find out, and your music uh, shop guy wouldn't just try and sell you anything. He would sell you something that would suit what it is you've gone in to buy. And then you'd be discussing the music business and gigs and, oh, I know him. Oh, and by the way, he was looking for a drummer for a session. Of it. Oh, I'll put you in touch with him because he was only in here the other day asking about drummer. That's how it used to go round and round and round. And it would be a very healthy business and a healthy situation for the music shop owner, for musicians in general, and everybody would then get something out of it. But now, everyone just wants to just... They don't even want to look at the drum. They see it on a picture, which is ridiculous. They order it, and it turns up, and away they go. They've got a clue, really, what they're doing. You know, I was just thinking, when you met, talk about the music shop, you go back far enough, and it wasn't just the instruments. You went to the music shop because they had the newest 45s in there to play the the newest music sometimes we'd get it from england and you you'd learn things not only from listening to that but sometimes the music store owner also was a musician and could explain to you what was going on with that record it was full service in that way exactly and that's what that's what got people's enthusiasm up enthusiasm up that's what got people excited about everything and that's as i said that's how you used to network get your info and um, you've got, you know, a million and one things more from doing that than you ever would from just typing Go on the computer. And the educational part of that gap, for some reason, no one's bothered educating the younger people uh, that that's the way you're... It's a bit like the, 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 um, the vinyl with the record sleeve. You put the, the record on and... While the record was playing, you'd be reading and enjoying the artwork and the information set out onto it. Well, yeah. if you don't explain to people that that's what you did because you got this out of it and that out of it and this is that and that, if you don't say any of that, the kids are quite happy to just download the one track for 90p. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. We Back in the day, and, and we the had limits. You, you got your 45 or you got your album. <laughs> And the music business has the capability of channeling that the right way so it saves itself. But they've chosen not to do it. 
And I find it astounding. As I said, it's a bit like the, the Pro Tool situation in studios now. Right? I can see, I remember doing a session once, I was probably about 20 years ago, but I, I remember doing a session once and the producer says, I can see you're out of time. Well, that says it all to me. What are you talking about? Music has never been about seeing, mate. Music is about um, shutting your eyes and listening. If it sounds right, it's right. It hasn't got to be perfect to be right. If it sounds right, it's right. And th things aren't about being in time and being in tune. It's about creativity. And that's what musicians do. They're expressing themselves and taking you on a, the most beautiful journey. And people, have, music has saved lives. It makes people cry. It takes you back to the first kiss. It takes you back to when you're out with your mates. It, it is the only thing that connects people with their lives. And all they're doing is destroying it through trying to make it look perfect. <laughs> it's absolutely astounding. <laughs> You uh, you sound like you're the the pastor of uh, music. <laughs> Going to preach it to well, us, brother. I know what music does. I really do. And you know, we 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 have we uh, uh, not me because I wasn't in the band then. But Uriah Heap, one hundred percent, have probably saved. Well, I don't know thousands and thousands of lives in the U Eastern European bloc and they're going through hell over there mm -hmm. um, with their governments and the black market, people getting uh, Uriah Heap's music, not only Uriah Heap, but I'm only speaking for Uriah Heap now, but Uriah Heap's music, we've had Russian people coming up, crying their eyes out, saying that they, uh, that the music of Uriah Heap stopped people committing suicide and, and all kinds of other funny stuff because it kept them going through life that is a connection that is equal to what? It's equal to nothing else. It's equal to humanity. It's equal to people being fantastic and nice to each other and, 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 and helping people out. But that's what music does. It's a, con a special connection that helps people through their lives. And, and to see it being destroyed by its own business because they're allowing the wrong things to happen for the wrong reasons. And then those same people will go back and put on the records from the 60s and 70s. That's what makes me die. Oh, listen to that. Look at that. Fantastic it is. Well, why won't you let that happen now then? Mm -hmm. If it's so great then, why are you changing it? We don't want it to sound better. We want the music to make us feel fantastic. <laughs> That's a pretty big responsibility for you as a musician, isn't it? To feel that you potentially are changing lives? Yeah, I it. If I don't connect with, with people out the front, what am I doing? Playing drums. That's it. That is it in a nutshell. It's my job. Those people have got to have the most amazing emotional feeling for whatever it is. That song that makes them cry or that song that gets them angry or sends them out there or puts them on a high or whatever it is, that is what music is. Music isn't there just to say, oh, I'm going to sing along to it. Music is a connection with someone and that, that you can't get anything more beautiful than a connection from a human to a human through music. So what That's what so it's always been about. Okay, go ahead. No, sorry, my gun. I, I was just going to ask, what song of Uriah Heep's first made a connection for you when you were a kid? Um, it's a bit of a tough one. I think July Morning is very... Was it? Mm -hmm. July Morning's got a very... You know, it's so dynamic. And um, it has the qualities of, you know, having that connection in there. Um, that I feel as though it... it 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 put itself across. I mean, the thing is, it's a personal thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one person, one person. You know, you know it's, it's like why people. Oh, I don't like that band. Or oh, I like that band. Well, I don't like that. I don't like. That. Well, because you know, it wouldn't be right for us all to like the same thing. One person likes steak. Someone else likes prawns. Someone doesn't like fish. Someone likes brandy. Someone likes whiskey. And so it goes continues. And music's a little bit like that, but. Human beings are all born the same, as far as I'm concerned. You know, the living human beings have all got an emotion. They all cry, right? They're all angry. They're all happy. They all have all of those emotions. And music can connect in all of those areas. It hasn't got to be so bad. It can, you know, that's why we have rock music. Rock music gets people angry. And people like to have that emotion for that moment. It makes them feel good. 
Sure. All those emotions make people feel good, and the only way to connect them is to hit them with it. Whether it's a film, you know, how many times have people have cried at films? Why are you crying? Because emotionally, that part has hit them. Well, you do it the same with a song. Absolutely. People like making love to certain songs. Why? Because that song is making them feel sexy. Mm -hmm. That song's making them feel angry. That song, you know, punk. It's like, yeah, you know, that's what music does. And if we start interfering with that, we're now interfering with human emotion. Well, we're not robots, so why are we interfering with human emotion? Perf perfection is a robot. Perfection isn't human, is it? I don't know any human that's per perfect. <laughs> it's crazy. So, when you go out, 2019, 50th anniversary, yeah. and I grant you that only Mick has been around for the 50 years, but there are going to be people who are going to come out. It's actually 2020. Is it 2020? I know it's borderline because it was around December. It was borderline. That's true. It was around December. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <laughs> we've had quite a few conversations, and Mick keeps laughing every time. He says, because like, it can be 19, it can be 20. I don't know what to do. I said, well, we need to do something. So, so I think because it's 70 which is a little bit better than 69, mm -hmm. it's going to be 20, which is rather better than 19, I believe. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that makes more sense. And, and that'll allow you to probably connect with some people who will say, you know, I haven't seen Heap since, well, maybe 1970, but people who will come out to experience something that they experienced in the past and say, I, I was a part of it then, I'm a part of it now. So really a historic aspect to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, um, you know, there's a, there's a few bands going out with the, the, the 50 thing going on, and that is pretty special in, you know, the music business as a whole. We certainly want to make a massive impact on the 50 because, you know, it just has to be done because I can't see any modern day bands, to be honest, doing their 50th because as I said the state of the music business the way in which it's changed has ruined the way in which bands have progressed and continue to grow and stuff like that but uh, we're certainly um, working on a lot of really cool and exciting things to celebrate the 50 years um, because we believe we deserve it but most of all we believe that um the fans in 61 countries certainly deserve it, and we want to give them the, the, the greatest um, experience of that. I know that uh, you did the United States and North America not too long ago, but I assume that there will be plans to come back. Oh, God, yes. I'll tell you what, the tour that we did in January February was absolutely outstanding. Uh, we got new management involved, which was phenomenal, with new agent, and they really did work their backsides off to put together a fabulous tour, not only of great places, a great routing, but it made our job so much easier um, to go out there and perform uh, to America and Canada, which you know, haven't been in Canada for donkey years, mm -hmm. and the reception was just sublime. I mean, that's the re whole reason for us to keep producing great music and keep um, making sure that we're a superb live live band that have those that chemistry and magic that I've just been talking about. Because it doesn't matter what band you are, we've heard it in the past. Oh, we went to see so and so and. You know, they were just going through the motions. I felt nothing, and they were very disappointing. And uh, that, you don't want to hear that. We want to go out there with people who are absolutely saying this is one of the best nights of our lives. Well, it's not because we're playing great. It's because we're connecting. Right. We've got that connection on stage. It works as a band, and that band translates over to that audience for that night. That makes that night one of the best nights they're ever going to have in their life. That is something special, and that works, and that's why we can't wait to go around uh, and, and do it again. And that's why America worked when we came over in January and February, because the the um, the people were gagging for it. We know that. When we haven't seen fans for a while, they can't wait. It means so much to them. It means so much to us. When we finally get out there, because the business has to be sorted out, otherwise we can't get out there, um, we we do what we do. And we can see that the people are just absolutely adoring it. Well, that's exactly why we do it. They love it. 
it's a win-win and so therefore of course we're going to be coming back and doing a, a hopefully a bigger tour absolutely well, i have to tell you this my first uriah heap experience was in indianapolis indiana in 1972 and Ooh, uh, you saw all the originals then uh well yeah that was the classic lineup and uh yeah there was a riot outside <laughs> of people trying to get oh. into the venue to see the band it almost uh it almost tore up the whole place god i, I you god, probably I don't made, have they, that they nowadays were, i hope <laughs> not quite because the whole the whole thing changed a bit but i'll tell you what in certain areas of the world they still go pretty pretty nuts. Yeah. It is quite amazing the impact. And and sometimes you don't realize I mean, don't forget I'm I'm seeing the impact second hand, obviously, as far as Mick's concerned. But um as I said, I know what the impact of music does to me and to see what it does to a non musician, to a to a fan that obviously um you know, it's their world, it's their life, this band and it's absolutely fantastic to see, and that's why we also make sure that we give a lot of time to our fans, because without them, we've planned nobody. We haven't got a life. We've got nothing. It's no good. You know, all, all the 30 hours on a tour bus and going through Moscow Airport eight times and all the traveling, what a waste of life. If those gigs and those people and the fans were not as good as they were, that blows that out of the water. That makes it the most special thing in the world, and that's why I keep doing it, and that's why everybody in the band keeps doing it. Because, that, as I said, it's all down to that connection. And when you get that, uh, the, 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 you get those, you see those people out there who are absolutely adoring everything you do on stage. It just makes you want to perform the best of your ability. You just keep doing it. There's no reason to change that. What a winning formula that is. Sure. Absolutely. Well, spend a little time at home and keep your feet up, I guess, to recharge the batteries and get ready for the next tour segment, which will uh, feature a fair amount of stuff from the new album, which I know a lot of people are, are eager to hear. And the new album will be out on September 14th called Living the Dream, and I've had a chance to hear it. And it is a great, great album. Uh, lots of energy, and obviously it is Uriah Heap, but it is not stuck in a time warp. It's something energetic and vital and new. So, Russell, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. That's no problem, Mark. I thank you very much for inviting me on. It's been a pleasure talking to you and everybody concerned. Russell Gilbrook is the drummer for the legendary Uriah Heap. I'm Mark Boardman for Sonic Perspectives. And let's go out with the single from the Heap's new album, Living the Dream. This is Grazed by Heaven. Mm -hmm. 